Good afternoon, everybody. It's my task to explain to you why Richards is an extremely consequential paleoanthropologist, and I want to try and explain his direct and indirect contributions to, uh, to paleoanthropology. This is a challenge for me because I will do my best to make this as objective as possible. But, uh, uh, but, uh, but he and I were, were friends for more than half a century, so I can't claim to be successful. One of Richard's names um, was Freer. And this was given to him because his mother, Mary Leakey, was the great granddaughter of John Freer, who is the, the guy on the left, um, who recovered flint hand axes and the, uh, the fossilized remains of extinct animals from near his home at a place called Hoxon in Suffolk. Um, he is credited with being the, uh, the father of prehistoric archaeology. Like Richard, he was a politician. He was a member of parliament. And he was also an FRS. And I have an intense dislike for the phrase, it is in their DNA, especially when it's applied to organizations, which as far as I do know, uh, as far as I know, do not have any. But in Richard's case, um, archaeology and paleontology really were metaphorically in his DNA. He was born before Lewis and Mary Leakey became household names. And the school holidays were spent either in Western Kenya or, or at Olduvai. He was effectively homeschooled by his parents in paleoanthropology. Um, he, he didn't like his high school, and he asked his parents if he could leave. And they said yes, as long as he supported himself. And so in addition to continuing to, uh, to trap animals for Des Bartlett, he um, recovered animals that had died in a drought in Kenya, and he sold their skeletons to universities and schools. And he made enough money doing this, as well as starting a small safari business, um, which was based initially on escorting the officials of the National Geographic Society when they came to visit his parents in Kenya. All these activities honed skills that were to prove extremely important in the years to come. And in 1962, Richard had earned enough money from this to, to buy an airplane. And when he was flying from, um, from Nairobi to Olduvai, he f flew over some sediments that were exposed in the region of Lake Natron, which was, um, uh, and the sediments looked like the ones that his parents were were working on at Olduvai. So encouraged by his parents and using part of the, near, of the NGS funding from his parents, I gather, without probably permission, uh, he, he organized a reconnaissance expedition to Lake Natron. And the person on the right is Glenn Isaac, who was the young archaeologist who, who went with him initially to Natron. They recovered some promising looking fossils in the region of Natron near the, uh, the Peninge River. And they, um, Richard returned to Nairobi with Glynn, and then he returned to Natron, um, not only with Glynn, but uh, with his younger brother and with Kamoya, Camus, who was working for his parents at um, who was working at the time with his parents at Olduvai, along with, the, with a photographer whose name that you might recognize called Hugo van Lawick. And the task of, Hugo, of uh, 
Hugo van Lawick was to, was to make a record of this expedition. And the expedition was extremely successful in that Kamoya recovered a mandible from the sediments, and the mandible is on the left for the archaeologists in the audience. And the, uh, <coughs> and, um, the, the, the mandible was clearly a good match for the, uh, the, uh, the cranium that his parents um, had found and had attributed to uh, Zinjantropus boisei. So the, this discovery is still one of the best preserved mandibles of Paranthropus boisei, as we now call it. And, um, and because of Hugo van Lawick's images and um, the, the, the discovery, um, they were able to raise funds from the National Geographic to go back to Natron. They didn't find any more hominins, but they did find some stone artifacts, which are now known to be 1.4 million years old or thereabouts. In 1965, after accompanying his father to the, end, uh, to the, uh, the National Geo um, Geographic Society in Washington, Richard attended a crammer in the UK and was destined to go to university. Uh, but, uh, but his safari business needed some attention. And so he came back to, uh, to Kenya and never went to university, which Richard described to me as the best decision he's ever made in his life, apart from marrying me. Richard then worked in the Baringo region where, um, where some discoveries, uh, some hominins have been discovered, a mandible and, uh, and an ulna. And uh, Richard persuaded his father that um, he should go and supervise the, uh, the expedition in the Beringo region. And no more hominins were recovered, but they recovered the skeleton, nearly the whole skeleton of an elephant. And the excavation of the skeleton, its preservation and its transfer to Nairobi um, were also experiences that, uh, that were very important for, uh, for Richard later on. The work in the Capturin formation also resulted in Richard's first solo publication. Lewis Leakey had always been interested in trying to expand the search for human origins to the, the, uh, the region of Ethiopia near the Omo River, where it drained into what then was called Lake Rudolph. Lewis had managed to persuade em the Emperor Haile Selassie to, uh, to allow an expedition, an international expedition, into southern Ethiopia. And there was a component from the USA. Um, and so they were going to go to the area which, uh, which is on the slide, you can see at the top of the slide. And they were going to go with an expedition that, was, uh, that had a component from the United States led by Clark Howe and one from, um, one from France that was due to be led by Camille Arenburg but, uh, but he was unwell, and it was led by Yves Coppens. And next week, some of us are going to a memorial meeting in Paris to, uh, to commemorate the, uh, the, the life of, um, of the latter. So um, Richard was the very junior partner leading the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the African component of the expedition. And he, um, maybe because of this, the area that was allocated to the Kenyans was either much younger than the, the, uh, the sediments that were, that were very productive at Olduvai or much older. 
They're also extremely difficult to get to. Richard was a little frustrated by this, and despite the fact that the expedition recovered the oldest evidence for Homo sapiens, um, it wasn't known to be that old at the time, but that's the case. Richard wasn't happy, and he asked to, uh, to borrow the helicopter, which the, uh, the well-funded Americans had at their disposal, and he was able to fly to look at the sediments at the northern end of what was then called Lake Rudolph, that he had been flying over on his way from, from Nairobi. So what he decided to do the following year was to say, yes, but no thank you to rejoining the International Omo Expedition and to go to, north, uh, to northern Kenya himself. And so there on the slide, you can see the Omo River, um, the Omo River entering into the, log, uh, the north of what was then called Lake Rudolph. And the region that, uh, that Richard had stopped in the helicopter is on the east side of the lake. The expedition, which was funded by the National Geographic Society in 1968, and of which I was by far the most junior member because I was a medical student, um, recovered a modest haul of hominins, not much, but enough to persuade the National Geographic Society to give him more money. The 1969 exhibition, um, the expedition, which included then Meve Epps and Kay Berensmeyer, who was in the audience, recovered a well-preserved, um, what by then by some was called Australopithecus or Paranthropus boisei cranium. And they also um, discovered some stone artifacts, which might and at the time were thought to be much older than those from Olduvai Gorge. Because at the time, the, the ash layer in which the artifacts were embedded was thought to be 2.6 million years old. The, the following year, Richard invited Glenn Isaac, who had gone with him to Natron, to be the co-leader of what became known as the East Rudolph Research Expedition. And at the heart of that expedition, and so this is Lake Rudolph, and the, uh, the, slide, the, uh, the image on the top left has a gentleman walking towards us who's also in the audience. And, um, and you can see the exposures. This is what, this is what the, uh, the fossil site looks like. It's not like Olduvai, which is sort of manageable. There is a main gorge and a side gorge at Olduvai, and Olduvai looks like everybody's idea of a fossil site. It's a gorge, and you can see the layers ni nicely arranged in the, uh, the side of the gorge. That wasn't the case at East Rudolph, and that, and that had implications for the, um, the, uh, the history of the research. But the Kenyans, um, most of the fossils were found by the, uh, the field crew, which was, which was employed by the National Museums of Kenya. And you can see on the left, Kamoya, Kamu, and other members of the team. The, the, um, the next year, more fossils were found. And, um, and those fossils, including the, the, uh, the cranium on the right, on the left is 406, which was the one that was found in 1969. And Richard Wayback uh, suggested that the, the cranium on the right was not a new species, but may well be the, 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 um, the um, representative of smaller bodied members of the same species as 406. And this was a very, this was a remarkably acute observation. 
the, the hominin fossils were coming thick and fast. And so Richard decided that he needed to plan for, for how they were published. So um, his idea was that he would, he would announce them in letters that he submitted to Nature. And uh, we in the expedition, or at least some of, some of us in the expedition, rather nautily referred to these as what I did in my summer holidays letters. And he sent these to, uh, to Nature. At his leaving party, John Maddox, who was the editor at the time, explained to me that he never sent Richard's manuscripts out for review. Um, what was the point? Because they were describing fossils that nobody else had seen, and uh, that when he, sent, when he sent articles from the leaky out to review, most people sort of dumped on them really out of principle. And so, and so John Maddox decided not to send them out to review. Most of these I hand delivered to the, the old nature offices in Little Essex Street. And nature, the nature offices were the floor below the offices of the Nursing Times, I remember, uh, which was also published by Macmillan at that time. So the, the next phase was to describe the hominin fossils um, without comparing them to other fossils, but just to describe what was there. This was criticized, but I still think it was an extremely sensible decision. Reference, uh, Richard's preference was that um, um, Kenyans should be involved in these descriptions, and so he recruited Joe Mungai, who was the professor of anatomy at the University of Nairobi. Joe Mungai suggested that he also involve Alan Walker, who was in the anatomy department at the University of Nairobi. And when the material was coming so thick and fast that, that the two of them couldn't cope, he recruited Michael Day, who was my PhD supervisor. And eventually, they scraped the barrel, and they invited me. The idea for the third phase was that we would write monographs which would compare the fossils coming from um, what by then was called Kubifora with the, the, uh, the fossils, the early hominins from elsewhere in Africa. None of the Walker, Day, Wood team had any particular expertise in cranial, and, in cranial um, morphology. None of us were dentists, and none of us had specialized in dental morphology. Um, so none of us were really keen to take on the task of making sense of the, of the vast majority of the fossils, which were the cranial and the mandibular and the, and the dental fossils. Richard, very characteristically, would not let seniority decide who did what. So we were all at a Venegren conference in New York, and we were staying at the Westbury Hotel, and Richard invited us into his room to try and see if we could come to a decision. We couldn't. So Richard went into the bathroom, and he broke three matches, and he put them between his fingers, and he came out of the bathroom, and he said, you have to pull a match. And the person who gets the longest match can choose what they work on. The person who can get with the, the second longest match can choose. So, so the choice was either the head, or the limbs, or a sort of a general look at all the fossil record. And the second person, and then the third person, has no choice. It is a matter of history that I drew the shortest match. 
And Richard said to me, Woody, you're doing the head. I should say to you that he used to call me Woody, and I used to call him Leeks, or if he was being very bad, Tricky Dicky. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so that, the match drawing took place in 1974, and the Kubi monograph on the cranial remains was published in 1991. Um, a, a very glacial rate of, of progress, but in my defense, nobody knew what the hell any of these things meant. And um, it took a long time to, uh, to travel across the world and to look at all the relevant fossils and so on and so forth. Um, Richard wasn't enamored with my interpretation. I think it's fair to say. Um, and, and, but um, he let me have my way, grudgingly at times, but, but he let me have my way. There is a, someone in this room who described a little book that was my first attempt to summarize um, human evolution as being concise to the point of abruptness. That is a good summary of Richard's preface for, um, for the, uh, the cranial monograph. It, <laughs> he said as much as he needed to say, but it certainly wasn't effusive. We laughed about it later. Then um, in the next field season in 19... 71, they, um, they recovered this little juvenile homo jaw, and we were very excited, and there's Richard looking at it, and we, we were extremely excited because there were clearly bones that were beneath. So we thought, boy, you know, there's the rest of the skeleton. And there was indeed a skeleton, but it happened to be of a giraffe. And these, and these bones just must have been washed um, together and it was very tantalizing, but the reality was the reality. That year they also found, uh, and that's a little child's jaw, and you can see on the, the incisors, these little marks, which are interruptions in the manufacture of enamel, which mark some sort of event in that child's life, maybe an infection or so. So there is absolutely, you know, the, 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 wonderful, the wonderful information that can be, that can be got from these, uh, from these fossils is just extraordinary. There was also a homo mandible, which um, we weren't allowed to, to assign things to, uh, to species, but, um, but just because we did what Richard was told, it doesn't mean everybody did what Richard was told, and so, Groves and Marzak, they use this mandible as the type specimen of a species called Homo ergaster. Then the following year, um, the, uh, the expedition discovered this cranium, which is um, um, here on the, uh, the front cover of Nature, along with some limb bones and, and some other specimens which clearly did not belong to Paranthropus boisei. You really don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize Paranthropus boisei. It is very distinctive. This material was not, uh, was not Paranthropus boisei and might be the, the, uh, the homo species that his parents have been discovering at Aldervai. News of the discovery of 1470 had leaked out, and Richard was a late invitee to a symposium at the Zoological Society of London, which was organized by um, Solly Zuckerman, Lord Zuckerman, to honor his mentor, who was Sir Grafton Elliot Smith. The press got wind of this, but uh, 
Zuckerman wouldn't let the press into the meeting room of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the Zoological Society of London. In fact, he was pretty pissed off by the whole business because Richard's, Richard's, um, Richard's discovery had really, you know, had, had really um, uh, removed the emphasis of the meeting, which was to honor Sir Grafton Elliot Smith. So we, uh, we, hastily arranged, uh, we hastily arranged a press conference at the, at the Kenyan embassy and the pictures of Richard in 1470, which were in the press at that time, were taken in the garden of the, of the Kenyan embassy in Portland Place. The, the, the field seasons after that, from 1973 to 1976, were extremely productive. Um, this was a cranium which was um, which was discovered at that time. And um, now you can see the cranium, okay? It looks very obvious. Where is it? Okay, it's a very hot day. You woke up at 5.30 in the morning. You had some tea for breakfast. You might have had something else for breakfast. You got in a Land Rover. You sat in the back of a Land Rover for two hours with your backside being bumped up and down if you were as junior as I was in the back of the Land Rover. You then had walked for three or four hours. Your attention had wandered. And so how do you find this? Well, the answer is that I didn't, but the Kenyans did. And there are the fragments of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tooth crowns, and then Richard and I flew up, and then I watched Richard excavate it, and you can see it's looking a little more promising. And now it's looking even more promising, and now it's looking even more promising because you can see around the back to see that there is a cranium, and then that's the cranium that you saw in, in the initial picture. So that's how the fossils are found. This, it, this, was an, uh, this was another discovery that was made in the, same, in the same year. And you can see Richard excavating the, uh, the, uh, the cranium of what is, what is an early African Homo erectus. This was found at more or less the same level. So there it is. This was found at more or less the same level as the, the cranium uh, that had been found by Richard and Meave in 1969. And at the time, there was a hypothesis that, that only one early hominin lived at any one time. It was called the single species hypothesis. And you don't have to be an expert to realize that these two crania don't belong to the same species. Um, if you look at the, them from the top, they're, they're very different. And this cranium, the discovery of this cranium was effectively the end of the single species hypothesis. The, the research then moved onto the west side of the lake and um, there, there was the discovery of, of the Chicana boy. And you can see here Richard and Alan Walker um, at the beginning of the excavation. And there is the resulting skeleton. A lot of work was involved between the beginning of that excavation and the recovery of all those fossils. And then also they discovered a likely precursor to, uh, to Paranthropus boisei, and this was the black skull. And then later, Meave discovered, um, discovered evidence of another hominin species that was living alongside Australopithecus afarensis. The 
The exposures at Kubiforo were unlike the exposures, the exposures, at, uh, the exposures at Olduvai, and that led to a controversy about the age of the uh, the fossils, including the 1470 cranium. And here is a picture of Richard. And I'm showing you this picture because it's the only picture I know of him not driving. So here's Richard and here's Ian Finlater. And there is Jack Miller. And there is Frank Fitch. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is that Richard did not want to use the scientists who had been responsible for dating the ash layers at Olduvai because those, are the, those were the ones his parents used and he wanted to be independent. So he recruited, he was advised that there were, there were two guys in the UK, Jack Miller at Cambridge and Frank Fitch, and that these two guys were hot shots at, um, at the, the, uh, the very difficult task of, of working out the ages of the ash layers. The problem was that f f uh, the, the, uh, the Fitch-Miller um, Fitch combination, uh, they made a mistake. And they used a new method which they called step heating, which they thought could, could, could reveal the real age of an ash which was very dirty. And, um, and they overplayed their hand and they made a mistake. This resulted in what was called the, uh, the, uh, the KBS controversy. And um, there was a lot of harsh there were a lot of harsh words which were, uh, which were exchanged. Uh, the, the, there was a meeting at the Geological Society of London in the 1970s that got extremely heated. Richard eventually realized that he'd backed the wrong horse. Richard had a very strong sense of loyalty. And so he was reluctant to abandon the older age just because older white-haired people said he should. And so Richard, um, he backed the, uh, what eventually we discovered was the wrong horse, but nonetheless, um, once he was convinced, he was so convinced that he invited Frank Brown, who was in charge of the dating at the, um, in the Omo Shungura formation, he invited Frank Brown to, uh, to come down to, uh, to work on the, uh, the sediments on the east and west side of the lake. So Richard was loyal and he was stubborn, but when he knew that he could change, he, he could change. So as well as leading the, uh, the teams that, that contributed directly to expanding the fossil and the archaeological record, Richard contributed much, much indirectly to, uh, to, paleo to paleoanthropology by establishing the, uh, the institutions and strengthening the at the National Museum of Kenya. Um, his father had been the curator of what was the Corinda Museum. And when I first went to Africa, it was pretty sleepy. It was largely visited by expats and it was largely staffed by expats. Richard dragged the old Corinda Museum, kicking and screaming, I think would be an would be an appropriate description into its new role as the flagship of the National Museums of Kenya. 
Richard was instrumental in raising funds for the International Lewis Leakey Memorial Institute for African Prehistory. Soon after, soon after it was officially opened in 1977, a kidney transplant took Richard away from Kenya for an extended period. During his absence, the, the Institute faced considerable uh, substantial administrative difficulties. And despite the best efforts of David Pilbeam, who took leave from Yale to be the scientific advisor to the director, when Richard came back from, from the UK with his new kidney, he, um, um, he, he integrated the, the functions and the buildings of the, uh, the Tilmiap into the National Museums of Kenya. Richard believed that, uh, that for the Takana region, long viewed as lacking um, natural resources or conventional natural resources, the remains of its prehistoric occupants, along with the archaeological, the, the archaeological evidence of their behavior, could be used to improve the health and the education and the economic prospects of that region. Um, you will hear more about that from, uh, from Dino later this afternoon. The mission of the, of the TBI extends well beyond paleoanthropology, but, but I cannot overstress its importance for paleoanthropology. As scientists, we bear responsibility and must accept the consequences of our, of our professional and, um, and personal behavior. That behavior determines our reputation along with our publications, our students, and our other mentees. And they all make up the uh, whatever professional legacy we have. As far as publications are concerned, one way of measuring the impact of a person's publications is called the H-index. And I'm grateful for Gordon um, Gustafson, who is a graduate student, who actually researched Richard's H-index. And Richard's H-index is, is approximately 55, which means that 55 of his publications have been cited at least 55 times. There is another index, which is called the Kardashian index, which Richard does really badly in. And there really is a Kardashian index. It's the, um, and Richard's, and my Kardashian index is zero uh, because it's the, number of Twitter followers um, divided by the number of times your papers have been cited. <laughs> so as neither Richard or I have any Twitter followers, we have a zero, um, we have a zero Kardashian index. But let me return to the H index, which is rather more conventional. Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, there are 43 people attending this meeting, and only seven of them have a higher H index than Richard. And damn it, it wasn't, you know, for us, it's our full-time job, okay. It wasn't Richard's full-time job. The H index of the, of the attendees range from 103, you know who you are, if I can find you, okay. And then the other seven, they go down to 63, and then Richard kicks in. So that's a remarkable achievement for somebody who wasn't a conventional academic. Richard had no students. And I also want to uh, show you some information which was very kindly provided um, by colleagues at the, uh, at the Virginia Commonwealth University. And it's a citation analysis. And this is Richard's impact on our field, shown visually. And this is a particular sort of aspect of it. Um, 
Richard's work, his scientific work, had a substantial impact. We should not forget that. Richard had no students in the conventional sense, but he influenced legions of people, including many in this room. He inspired a huge global audience through his writing and his speaking. And I've lost count of the number of people, including many prominent academics, who tell me that their interest in human evolution was sparked by attending one of his lectures or reading one of his books or looking at films that he featured or by receiving a handwritten letter of encouragement. He gave many people, in, including me, life-changing opportunities, and in my case, twice. The expeditions he led or facilitated or encouraged, these were the early hominins that were known when Richard was born. These are the early hominins that are recognized today. These are the early hominins that Richard's work substantially contributed to their fossil record. And I could also put red dotted lines around lots of other taxa that were either discovered by Meave or by people that Richard encouraged. Richard prided himself in not being, a con not being a conventional academic. He wore it as a badge of courage, indeed. But his upbringing and his early career provided him with experiences and influences no conventional university education could possibly have, have uh, supplied. He was a natural leader, and occasionally, um, and only occasionally, was his primacy challenged. In the 19... 70s, he played host to Prince Philip, who was in Africa um, looking at birds on a, on a bird watching expedition. And Prince Philip and his bird watching friends came for lunch, and Richard indicated to Prince Philip that he should sit next to him because, as Richard said, um, as Richard said to Prince Philip, I always sit at the head of the table. And, then Prince Philip looked at him and said, where I sit becomes the head of the table. <laughs> the rest of us smiled, but we made sure that it didn't show. <laughs> Richard enjoyed unusual opportunities and privileges, but no one, could have, no one could have exploited them for the common good more successfully and with as much style and with as much humor as he did. It was my good fortune to have been Richard's friend and colleague for a long time. In 1793, William Blake wrote that opposition is true friendship. Richard and I told each other not what we each wanted to know, but what we felt the other should know. We both understood that our ability to do this and remain friends was a precious gift. As my students will tell you, I am averse to hyperbole, and I normally avoid adverbs. But Richard really was a very consequential paleoanthropologist. Richard, thank you, Asante-sana.